This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less taxes. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder and CEO of Wealth Ability. So there's been a lot of discussion about money when it comes to the, uh, the COVID crisis and where's money coming from and where's it going um, and who's going to pay for this. And today, a very special guest, um, Sal DeSisio, an old friend, uh, a good friend of mine. Um, we've known each other for many, many years. And Sal is a uh, member of the Phoenix City Council, has been for many, many years. And uh, I'm just dying to have this conversation because, you know, we talk a lot about the the federal government, we, there's a lot of focus on the federal government, what the federal government's doing, and there's some focus on the state government, but really you have all these cities, and what are the cities doing, and how are the cities dealing with this, and you know, what's going on from a revenue standpoint, and what might go on from a tax standpoint. So this affects all of us in our businesses, um, whether you're in Phoenix or whether you're any city, every city has to deal with this. So, uh, Sal, it's great to have you uh, with us today. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for putting this information out. You always do. You give people the edge, uh, the way I look at it, uh, of what's happening out there and it, that they don't get a chance to see through the mainstream media. <laughs> well, that's, you really do. That's for sure. <laughs> there's, there's not much uh, independent analysis going on in mainstream yeah. media right now, that's for no, sure. No. <laughs> so, Sal, uh, if you could, just uh, a little bit of your background, um, you know, uh, both on the council and then as a business owner. Well, I'm a business owner, but at the same time, I've been on the Phoenix City Council this term since 2009, and I'm heading into my last two years. I'm looking forward to it, and just to get back into business and enjoying my family and, you know, seeing the impact of government, what it can, and, and how it really destroys lives and how it has such a negative impact on people when it could have a positive impact. Interesting. So, all right. So, uh, we were uh, chatting a little bit earlier about um, uh, what your costs are. Let's, let's start with the costs to the city. What are the, when it, when it comes to city, I mean, we know that the, you know, the, the state has hospitals and they have to deal with that and they have, you know, out-of-pocket costs there. What are your costs and, and what is it the cities are having to deal with? Well, the cities generally, as a general rule, don't get themselves involved in the medical side of it. They don't get themselves in the hospitals or schooling. Now, Chicago, that's part of the city, right? But most cities don't do that. So most cities, the cost is indirect, if any. Uh, the direct cost would be more toward, like we own the airport, or the taxpayers own the airport. Uh, that would loss of revenue there. We have police and fire that have to deal with COVID. But outside of that, very little. And so in this last CARES Act, this CARES Act was meant to really prop up the economy and get people going. Just like anything else, it became a big scam for these big cities. Any city over 500,000 in population got direct funding from the federal government direct funding. And those monies were meant to, you know, help us with the COVID, help us, you know, with the testing and all that. So out of $293 million that the, uh, the federal government sent of your money, Tom, and everybody else's money that's listening in on this, was sent to the city of Phoenix. $1 million was spent on testing of the public. That's it. That actually right. explains a lot, given the uh, <laughs> little amount of testing that we, we've had in Phoenix early on. Right. And it's been horrible. I mean, if you think about it, that was the number one thing everyone talked about. We got to test. We got to do contact tracing. We got to do all those things. One million. That's it. That was spent. And my guess is that this is happening around the country. The rest of it went into basically kind of a slush fund to fund these small so-called community groups that then hire protesters to go out there and protest. And it was spent on arts programs. Uh, some of it went directly into businesses, but small amounts did. And so at the end of the day, the majority of the money went to government. And government went it to prop up their own budget. At the same time, while everybody else was suffering in the public, the small business owners, everybody else, they were barely making it, right? Government was able to take care of themselves with these monies. And now they want more. I would say to the president, do not do it. 
Interesting, because, uh, of course, that's one of the big uh, sticking points, right, on this new stimulus package is um, uh, the, the Senate doesn't want to give money to the states, and the House wants to give billions and billions and billions of dollars to the states, which I presume the states means also cities, right? So, um, so but I, would got, I have to believe that you've had a huge loss of revenue, um, because uh, um, if you would just explain, so I, I don't think the public necessarily knows this, where do monies come from to fund the city? Well, every city is a little different, but most of us have, you know, basically the stools of the chair. You have your property tax, your sales tax, and then you have additional revenue that are in there, right, that you collect from fees and things like that. But that's pretty much it. Your sales tax, for the city of Phoenix, sales tax is about 42% of our budget. Then we got another 15 to 20 percent that come from property tax. Whereas cities back east, they rely heavier, uh, they more you know, more heavy heavier on uh, property tax. So it all comes down to a combination of how the, the uh, how the cities just basically tax their public, and some have income tax. We don't. But sales tax is a big part. I mean, almost 50%, right, is sales yes. tax. And those revenues right. have got, I mean, you, you mentioned that um, the city owns the airport, Sky Harbor Airport, one of the busiest airports in the country. And uh, the airport is, uh, uh, has been empty for, you know, for substantially empty for a long right. time. So, there, and I know that the, like the restaurants, uh, Phoenix was one of, uh, Sky Harbor is one of the first um, airports to really fill up with really nice local restaurants. And I know, I, I happen to know that a lot of those restaurants have just gone out of business. So, um, so what, you know, is, is the money that you got from the federal government making up that shortfall or is there going to be some kind of a tax increase like a sales tax increase or something that you're going to have to do? Well, let's take, uh, let's take the airport and our general fund together. The airport got another $140 million. Oh, <laughs> so they got additional monies to do what they wanted to do. Oh no, this whole thing has been nothing but a disaster for the federal government and we're paying for it as taxpayers, okay? Sure. So what's gonna end up happening is the city of Phoenix is obviously part of the lobbying group that wants more money from the federal government. We are fine right now. We put at least $143 million of the COVID money that went supposed to go to testing and COVID-19 and all that to protect the public. We went to protecting our budget. So at the end of the day, we should be okay. Uh, we had a projection of about 50 to $75 million in losses. I think it's going to be higher. But with the amount of monies that came from the federal government, and every city stealing from the federal government, so let me be more direct about that. And so with those monies, I think we're going to end up being okay. But cities are going to cry, you know, we're poor because they want to fund themselves. That's exactly what it's coming down to. So here's where the biggest crunch is going to be. And you know this better than anybody. These pension costs are driving the cost of government higher. Mm -hmm. So it forces Phoenix to do things like this, to steal money from other areas that the public needs and needs to be protected. It's going to become nothing more than a pension paying machine. So it's all circular, you know, it's all circular. Well, I know you've had uh, many, we've had many discussions about the pension uh, uh, crisis from a, from a taxpayer standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so um, just so, just to give people a little bit, because I, I think a lot of our listeners have not, you know, don't know about this. Yeah. Um, you know, our friend Robert Kiyosaki recently wrote a book about who stole my pension, which is about uh, teachers pensions uh, is in particular going out of business, really, I mean, going, going bankrupt. But uh, those pensions for the, um, uh, for the uh, fire department and the police department, who, you know, we want to support, they're certainly not going bankrupt now, are they? Well, they sort of are. I mean, their pensions are horrible right now, at least in the city of Phoenix. Uh, but around the country, not all of them are. So, I mean, it really comes down to what area of town that you're in and how you handle those pensions. But what ends up happening, it's nothing different than a credit card. You know, you're adding more and more debt, right? And as you add more and more debt, your, your minimum payment goes up, which means right. you can't afford to do anything else. So when you see deteriorated streets, you see lack of services and this complaining, even though your city may be getting more and more money, it's because it's paying more and more toward these pension crises that we're all in, that Robert has been amazing at. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So, um, what, what do you <clears throat> get out of your crystal ball, Sal? 
Sure. Uh, what, what do you see happening in the next six months to a year uh, when it comes to government and whether it's city government? Um, what conversations have you had? I know you've had some conversations with health officials. Uh, yeah. what, what, what do you see coming down the pike? Well, let me give you at least a concern I've got with the COVID. Okay, so I really believe that this lockdown, the extended lockdown, was a, was a major mistake. And let me explain why I believe it is and why it's going to have an impact on local governments too. So one is on the medical side of it, is that you're going to get herd immunity one way or the other, either through our official ways of a vaccination or you get it by you know, people getting sick, right? And they create the wall around those people that are vulnerable. So the, the short-term lockdown is what I'll call it, uh, was meant to get the hospitals ready so that they can be prepared. So now what happened, most governments have extended that out. By extending it out, you've kept people away, healthy people away, right? And so now, and they're what I would consider to be the less vulnerable. Now what happens, Tom, when COVID-19, which is a type of flu, it's part of the whole coronavirus, right? Meets the common flu. People that are normally healthy and less vulnerable, are now going to be facing a crisis because what happens when a healthy person gets the flu and COVID at the same time? So I think that in the next few months, we'll know by the end of September, that's when the flu really starts kicking up, what this is gonna be. And so if that starts to occur, you're gonna start seeing another shutdown and another shutdown means loss of revenues, which means now cities are really gonna have an impact. So this lockdown, not only did it cost us 3 trillion and maybe $4 trillion, and just horrible time and people losing their jobs, more suicides, domestic violence, violence increases. People don't, they're, they're not taking into account all the ancillary effects of the shutdown. And how many people are gonna lose their homes? A lot. So once you look at that, then you combine the medical side of this that I believe, I'm not a doctor, but when these two things merge and hit at the same time because of this lockdown, I think we're going to have a bigger crisis coming forward. And I hope I'm wrong. So, um, so you know, obviously what happened, and let's talk about what happened in Arizona. Um, what, what happened was we had a lockdown. It was a short lockdown. Yeah. And then um, the southern states all opened, like, really quickly. Um, and and I've, I, I've always theorized, and this is my theory, this is the theory of Tom Wheelwright, that, that the reason they did is because um, – they, you know, there was some pretty strong feeling that the virus would not survive the heat, right? Because typically we don't have the flu in the summer, right? And if this is a flu type virus, why would we have this in the summer? Um, but they did open up quickly. And of course, Arizona um, had uh, horrendous results. Um, uh, you know, our, our, our friend, uh, the cardiologist is uh, saying that, you know, they were doing triage at the hospitals uh, where they had to decide life and death before they even, so they, they didn't even treat some patients, um, which is hugely stressful for the, and, and of course, then the families are just devastated by this. Um, so you had a huge impact on the hospital system right when that opened back up okay and so so what it, the cities tend to do is they oh well then we need to shut back down right and and um so you know what do you see um as the uh, as the prospect for shutdowns let's take phoenix as an example i mean you have governor Ducey, who's a very conservative governor um business owner himself um, and then you have the, the, the cities, Phoenix, which is uh, not nearly so conservative as a... Uh, <laughs> or at all. <laughs> or, or at all, right? It's a, it's a much more liberal um, location than the state is. So how do you... And, and one of, the, of course, one of the big issues also has been a, a lack of consistency between city and state and federal. So what do you think is going to happen, um, you know, when it comes to the virus hits again like this? Are we... Uh, uh, you see Arizona going into another extended shutdown? Or do you, you think the hospitals are going to be able to handle it? I hope not. And yes, I do believe the hospitals can handle it. That the whole reason for the first shutdown was for them to ramp up. So if you take a look at the shutdown, take a look at New York, right? Remember how bad it was at the very beginning? Right. Well, I believe they've reached a type of herd immunity there, and you're going to see less and less cases. Likewise, when people went back into their, went into their homes, right? And the virus just didn't go away. I had a conversation with the governor's office on this. I said, you've got to warn the public that that virus is still lingering out there. And it only takes one. You could be completely free of it, right? One person comes in and then all of a sudden that's going to happen. 
with seven and a half million people. That's going to happen, Tom. So we didn't do a very good job of warning people that the virus is still out there, right? But once you've opened it up, you've now started getting people through this process of getting this herd immunity. It sounds cold because you, every, everybody's life matters for sure, 100,000%. But at the end of the day, people are going to be getting this. And if you start doing another shutdown, all you're doing is putting people away. Then you've got to expect the vaccine to come in. Then you've got to get about 70% of the public vaccinated or some type of herd immunity. So once they get that, Tom, then you're pretty well protected and people are still going to get it, but not to the degree, right? Right. But if we go through another shutdown, I believe it's going to be worse. And the delay, again, I think is even worse than what we've done because in the summer months is when you kind of want that flu virus out there as a general rule, you know, if it acts like most other flu viruses, right? But boy, once the winter comes and you still got that COVID around because people have been shut down, I think it's worse. So let me ask you a question, just very practically. Yeah. Do you think, first of all, do you think um, uh, Governor Ducey will shut down the state again? No, I don't. I've had conversations with his office. I hope that he does not do that. I think that would just be a horrible mistake financially and medically. And what about Phoenix? Well, Phoenix always wants to shut everything down. <laughs> if no one, you know, the, the, the politicians in the city of Phoenix want to keep everything shut down until there's a vaccine, which means next year. So at the end of the day, Interesting. you know, yeah, most cities are run by the left. They just are. Whether you're in a conservative state like Georgia or even parts of Florida, the cities themselves are dominated by the left. I'm kind of the outlier of the city. You know, if you think about it, it's, you know, very few people talk like this in government. So what ends up happening is they will always follow the, the national mantra. It will be a knee-jerk reaction rather than looking at the facts. You have another dynamic that's occurring across the country, and it's happening here in Arizona. The hospitals only see what the hospitals see, right? Sure, so they see the crisis every day. That's all they see. So they're the ones that really pushed the lockdown hard the first time and have been pushing it behind the scenes still, you know, because that's how they see the world. There's still 99.7% of the population that's out there that lives under a different world, right? And, and a different aspect. So if you talk to the hospitals, they see it one way. If you talk about to most of the other doctors that are out there that own the surgery centers and places like that, they should never have been shut down. Think about it. They're probably one of the most cleanest places on, on the planet, right? Right. They just are. Of course, they're going to have disease. They're going to have things in there because people are sick. But people going in for day-to-day -day operations and things that they needed to be taken care of, why would you shut them down? You would not. But that's what we did. Well, so, they, I, I mean, world. clearly some of that was because they, they had no PPE, right? Um, right. They, were, they were very concerned about, will the doctors have uh, masks? Will the doctors right. have, uh, a, a, you know, um, uh, aprons, et cetera? So, um, right. I, I, you know, clearly that was part of that. And hopefully that part is passed. Um, what do you see um, if, 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 let's say the government does not provide another round of funding? Um, to the states and the cities. Um, can, will the cities be able to um, handle this or will they, be, will they be forced to raise taxes? Well, they're always going to say, they're going to come up with one excuse or another to raise taxes. That will always exist. I think that would be a serious mistake on the federal government's part to fund the states and the cities. You're also going to be funding bad behavior in the past, right? Because there's really a, hardly any way to, to prevent that. So I would take the states, the cities, the local governments out of the equation. The ones that really need the help are the local businesses, the small business owners. You know, the large guys pretty much take care of themselves and they find a way to take care of themselves, Tom. But the small guy, they're the ones that always get screwed, okay? They really do. They're the ones that need to be taken care of. A good friend of mine owns quite a few shopping centers with small business owners. I asked him the other day, well, a little while ago, I said, you know, what would you consider to be success? He goes, Sal, if I could save 70%. I said, so that means 30% are going to lose their business that they've worked their entire lives for? And he goes, yes. He goes, it's the saddest thing I've ever seen. Mom and pops that have saved for their entire lives try to create a nest egg for themselves. And they're going out of business. And very few people have been concerned about them or talking about them. They are the ones that should be the focus 
even your independent contractors, your real estate agents, people like that, those individuals, everybody has been suffering through this thing, except for the government. The government has always been getting a paycheck. They've been at home. They've been able to do their things at home. They don't want to really go back to work. Why should they? If, you know, if they're going to get a paycheck, right? So the small business owner in particular has been screwed out of this entire process. Well, I'm curious, what percentage of, uh, of government leaders in uh, local leaders uh, come from the business community? In other words, have any business experience? In Phoenix, I'm the only one that has its own, its own, you know, its own business and things like that. I'm the only one out of nine. But I would lay odds most don't. Most come back through, through you know, as community leaders, uh, those kinds of things. And so they get elected. They know how to run campaigns. They know how to get people motivated, that kind of thing. And they know how to generate people out to the polls. Business owners don't. They run a business. They take care of their families. They volunteer you know, for their kids' softball and baseball games. They do those things. You know, They kind of hope that other people would take care of them, but they haven't. They've done a very bad job. So do you, do you think that's one of the uh, reasons that uh, it, it would appear that the, particularly the cities don't understand um, that you can't just shut down and start up, shut down and start up again as a business? They, exactly. You lose, your, you lose your clients, right, or your customers. Well, not, not just that. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking uh, I have a friend who um, owns, a, is, is a, owns a couple of franchises and um, they had a bunch of beer. Yeah. Well, what do they do with the beer? It's not like beer lasts forever, no. you know? And so, you know, they had a real issue with uh, having a huge supply of beer. And what do they do with it, right? I mean, in the bottles, they were, they were almost giving it away with orders, right? With the takeout orders. Um, but with the kegs, you can't do that, right? So, I mean, it's, it's like, that type of stuff or ordering food. You know, if you're a restaurant, how do you maintain your food? How do you maintain your staff? Um, a lot of people have gone, well, you know, I don't, you know, a lot of people don't want to go back to work. Some of them because of health concerns, right? Because they might have, um, even if they're young, they might have a, a, right. a parent or a grandparent that is exactly. at, at high risk. Um, others because they, they don't want to go back to work because <laughs> frankly, the government's paying their wages. You know, why should they go back to work? Um, so, so the staffing is an issue. So any ideas um, about how to deal with that? Well, you've got to give people incentives. Incentives always work. Look, at, look at, you know this better than anyone. What is it? 46,000 words in our tax code, right? Those are all incentives in there. They are. They are all geared toward what? Guiding you to where you should do it, right? So they're, it's basically, people think of it. I, I'm dumb. glad to hear you've been listening to me, Sal. This oh, I'm listening to you. That, that just good. makes my heart feel good. <laughs> well, even on my Facebook post today, I talked about um, the tax code being an incentive-based code. It tells awesome. you where to put your money, where to put your time, and how to invest, right? It tells you everything. It's a book. So not that I've read it all, like you. I mean, you know every word in it, Tom. That I know already. So, but, you know, but that's what it is. It's, you know, so likewise, if you want to do something, you've got to give people incentives to go back to work and disincentives, right? You've also got to create that. You've got to have, a, you know, the carrot and the hammer in both hands, right? And, you know, the carrot and the stick, I guess, is what the, the right terminology. But at the end of the day, if you don't provide that, you just provide an incentive not to go to work. Well, that's what people are going to do. Humans are humans. You know, you're not going to change our social nature, you know, to do something that's just outside of our best interest. Uh, right. Interesting. So, OK, so in the few minutes we have left, one of the things we always like to do uh, on the WealthAbility Show is uh, talk about a few practical things people can do. So if you are a business owner, OK, yep. which you've you've been for many, many years. Uh, what would you do in order to um, deal with this crisis? Well, that's a really tough one because every individual business is different, right? From my end, you know, I do more on the commercial real estate side of investing projects and things like that. So I pick the things that I see coming. So I think the office market is going to fail. People just don't want to go back. A large company, a friend of mine that's doing a project with me right now, as a lender that has about 40,000 employees. Of those, four, they pulled every single one. Of those 40,000, 35,000 said they did not want to go back into an office setting. Well, of course not, 
Right. Period. Yeah. Ever. And, ever. Wow. So, what is that going to do to the office? Wow. So, yeah, just as an investor looking at it, you want to look at that. I mean, people see that as a problem, but you could also see it as an advantage. Right. Now, how would you repurpose that? Okay. Right. So we know the industrial market is growing by leaps and bounds because people just moved into basically online services, right? That's just what they've done. So you got, you got to look at what you see the trends are. Don't see things as problems. Don't ever look at things as a problem. Look at it as an opportunity and how will that be repurposed? So every business is going to be different. And I'll give you one more thought too. So if you look at it, remember what happened with the, the driving, the fuel costs and all that stuff and, and how that changed people's attitudes toward driving, right? Well, mine has, hasn't changed, even though in Arizona, we're about 240 a gallon, right? California's five bucks a gallon. So my driving habits readjusted and changed, right? So I believe that pandemics and crises like this really speed up what it already was coming. It's, it, this was already coming in this direction, right? But it just put everything in hyperdrive. So now people are working more from their homes and expecting to work from their homes more. So you're going to see less and less of those types of services. So as a business owner, you got to be thinking how the rest of the public thinks, not how you think, but how does the world see it? And that's where you ought to be looking at. You know, this is what I love. And thank you for that, Sal. Um, I, I, I notice I've got, there's two groups of people I spend time with and one's yeah. the business owners and one's everybody else, right? Yeah. <laughs> the entrepreneurs, right? Not right. just the business owners, but the real entrepreneurs like yourself. And what I find is, is the entrepreneurs always look at this as an opportunity, right? They look at an emergency as how can I emerge with an opportunity here? Mm -hmm. And, and one of the things that we, we know is that we have to adapt very quickly right now, but we can adapt to something better, not to something, you know, th thinking that things are going to remain the same. I think that's one of the things I'm hearing from you thinking that something's going to remain the same is a huge mistake. It's kind of like, um, frankly, I think that the people who are unemployed, um, thinking that they're going to be able to continue to get employment, might be a big mistake. But what they ought to be thinking of is, well, wait a minute, I'm at home. I've been sitting, I've been on my computer um, online. I've been, you know, I've been, I've been, you know, um, surfing the internet or I've been, you know, watching, you know, I've been watching, um, you know, Amazon Prime or whatever, right? And maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to start a business here, right? Maybe right. instead of having a single customer, um, which is what it is to have a job, right? You have one customer. That's what happens when you have a job. And maybe I want to have many customers so they don't have so much risk going forward. I've always thought that uh, people were funny. Uh, I always thought it was funny when people say, well, I'm going to get a job because that's a conservative thing to do. I'm going, I'm not understanding how having one customer is the conservative thing to do. To, to, <laughs> to me, having lots of customers would be way more conservative. Um, you know, if you're thinking about, um, you know, you've dealt with banks for your whole career, right? In, in lending, right. if you had one customer, is the bank gonna lend to you? And <laughs> the answer is, well, no, no, it's too much risk, right? right. And yet we think that a job is, uh, is not risky. So um, certainly I, I, I love what you're saying. Um, I, 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 that's my analysis of the situation as well, is that we really need to be adapting. We need to be looking at what are the opportunities here. And I love the idea that you say that we need to think not how we're thinking, but how's our customer thinking and really looking at what, what are they doing and, and what's their focus. Um, and then I, I, I love the other part. Thank you for reminding everybody that the tax law is a series of incentives. And so the other thing, of course, we can do if we want to put cash in our pocket is to reduce our taxes. Actually, the easiest way to, re, to, to put cash in your pocket is to reduce your taxes um, because they are all incentives. And of course, those incentives change all the time, which is why I stay in business. And uh, my, <laughs> my network of CPA stays in business because they're constantly changing, right? I mean, like literally every week right now, we're getting new regulations from the IRS or a new law right. from the government, something. And so I just, I wanna thank you, Sal. Um, uh, if, if people wanted information about uh, what cities are doing, where would they go for that? That's a tough call. They'd have to probably get a hold of their own city, but that's, their own city is going to lie to them anyways. So it's really hard. I think places like your show are amazing. And now remember about the tax code. You taught me that when we first met 
probably 10, 15 years ago, whenever that was, Tom, you put that into my head. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's absolutely right. That's how I did make my business decisions already. So, you know, you did that. And, you know, Thank you've you. been t telling me that for years. It's hit, hit, it's hit home and it's true. So I think what people need to do is they really, the mainstream media will not give them anything. It just isn't going to happen. They're going to have to search out and do a little work on their own and find people like yourself, Tom, that present them ideas that move them ahead. Because the mainstream media will tell you how bad you are. People like you, Tom, tell people how good they are and how they can move ahead. Awesome. So thank you, Sal DeCicio, uh, uh, Phoenix City Council. Remember that, you know, your, your city may be slightly different, but really a lot of the cities, cities tend to behave the same as each other. And um, while the states may seem to be very different from each other, the cities seem to be very consistent um, in how they're behaving really uh, across. And, um, and, and remember that there are things we can do. I mean, this is the great thing. I always say it's not about the economy. It's all about your economy. And, you know, when we focus on our own economy and taking control of our own wealth, then we're always going to make way more money and pay way less taxes. See you next time. Thanks, Al. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.